to the Boot Startups Podcast, connecting the opaque world of boot startups. Hey guys, welcome to episode number 69 of the Food Startups Podcast. If you could leave a review in iTunes or Stitcher, that would really help us out because we're trying to get the show out to more and more people as we grow and continue to have amazing guests on the show. And today's guest, it's really impressive. And I want to start off with one misconception you may have by reading the headline and what I write here is that, you know, she got mentioned in the 2016 Michelin New York City Guide in less than a year in business, but it's not an overnight success. So I want to take a step back, right? And we'll talk about this in the show, but you know, she studied in in Paris, was a sous chef or a famous chef over there in Paris. And then, then later culinary arts, um, you know, going back to school, additional schooling, and also working under a very renowned chef from Blue Hill named Dan Barber. Um, so I guess what I want to point out is, you know, one, it's not an overnight success. You know, she worked really, really hard. So not to be discouraged and to develop the long-term mindset, which we've talked about before. It's going to take a long time. You know, it's going to take some years to really get going, usually. What else can I say? I'd say that uh, another thing to look at is she has so much passion for what she's doing and she wouldn't be where she is today. Like she would still be a very, um, you know, successful pastry chef or sous chef at a, at a great restaurant, but she still decided to make the leap. And even with all the experience that she had, you know, that was a big risk going into one of the most difficult and saturated markets in New York City. So it's a really incredible story. And uh, yeah, I think that's about it. And we'll cover the rest in the show. At the heart of her business is the passion for handcrafting one-of-a-kind cakes, chocolates, and mini sweets using the finest ingredients and designing them to sparkle. Hence the slogan, a bite of bling. She is a lifelong pastry chef who in late 2014 started her own company in New York, Mini Melanie. She also recently was included in the Michelin 2016 New York City Guide. Melanie Moss, thanks for coming on the show. And I'm looking at Instagram right now and I see an amazing photo. I, I would never even think of this. It looks, it's a pastry, I guess it's a, a truck. I believe, of an emerald that's chocolate-filled and stuff. Mm. So, I mean, what inspired the bling to your pastry? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Matt, so much for having me on the show. It's really great to talk with you, and I'm a big fan. And, yeah, basically, I just start. I've been baking my whole life growing up and then in restaurant kitchens. And I started, once I quit the restaurant world, I started just baking and trying my own recipes out and, you know, People were buying them and I was delivering to some offices around the city and I was baking really sort of wholesome things like chocolate chip cookies and muffins and scones and things that I was a little bit familiar with. And I've always loved to challenge and, you know, I was developing, you know, my recipes that are my own and, um, I started to do a little bit more research as I started to think about creating my own business and looking at who's at uh, festivals in New York, like Smargisburg and other markets. And it seems like in New York, there's a really solid amount of businesses and small bakeries that are doing the sort of nostalgic, familiar, wholesome goods. But I wanted to create something that's totally different. And that's what I did with these jewel inspired sweets, whether they're cakes or they're the chocolates or our cupcakes. They definitely have a wedding aspect to them, but overall, just they invite celebration. And I really think that the reason that no one has gone this route before is because it was definitely a recipe testing challenge and the production of it is very meticulous and involves a lot of handiwork. So after months of recipe testing, I felt, you know, really excited to bring these new products out into New York City and the response has been really great. And okay, great. And so we'll get a little bit more into your background and all your culinary studies and and experience. But I'd like to know, I guess, what was like, what made you decide to stop working at someone else's restaurant and start uh, baking for yourself? Well, yeah, I I don't have a business background at all. But 
I guess that I just really wanted to be doing this for myself. If I was going to be working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I wanted to do it for myself. And I, I, you know, I'm in New York City. There's so much inspiration here. I'm surrounded by so many interesting startups that I'm familiar with. I mean, no one in my family, none of my friends really are chefs for the most part, but they all, you know, work at startups. And I was just really inspired to start my own thing. And after college, I had tried working in an office and I knew I didn't want to go back to that. So, you know, what do I do with my culinary degree? I didn't really want to teach. And yeah, I just wanted to develop something new and different and just go with my instincts. So, so far, it's been good. And I, you know, just wanted to find something that wasn't out there on the market and that I thought was really delicious and really exciting and really beautiful and that people would respond well to. Right on. And so I've you know, I'm looking around uh, on your site here. And so tell us a little bit more about the types of customers, like the, your customer profile. Sure. Well, we do a lot of office catering. So we have that portion of the menu that are our larger cakes. And they're definitely not your typical like office sheet cakes. So our customers really love that. And yeah, I think startups really like supporting other startups. So For example, our customers range from Spotify to a startup in the city called Simul Media to another startup called One Fine Stay. And yeah, they're always on the lookout for new and unusual things and how to show their clients. We do a lot of clients gifts, so how to show their clients that they're up on the New York City pulse and they, you know, know what's new. They're not just going to do, you know, a crumbs cupcake or something like that. They're looking for new artisanal things to give their clients or to give their employees to, you know, celebrate in the office. And then we do a good amount of weddings, so and we do the full gamut of dealing with that with uh, with the bride and groom, whether it's the bachelorette party or the bridal shower or the groom's cake or, of course, wedding cakes. We do a couple wedding cakes a month, and they're all extremely tailored to specific pictures, requests. That's definitely my specialty and one thing that gives me a lot of pride, and I love, and I love doing that. And then we do a lot of private events and work with several wedding planners and event planners, um, whether it's corporate events or nonprofit or private, and um, they can be small, you know, for five to 10 people um, looking to have some fantastic desserts or, you know, up to 400. And we, we work with a catering company on those large events and they buy, you know, cupcakes or whoopie pies from us and some of our mini cakes. So it's um, pretty diverse. We're not in any stores at the moment. We're interested in that, but um, we're actually just a team of two. So, um, <laughs> and um, we're creating a physical product. So we're looking forward to setting some exciting goals for 2016. Wow, it looks like you guys are probably going to have to expand at uh, some point. Now, <laughs> like a uh, question for you. Are you, so are you still working 24-7? Yeah, yeah, I I love it so much. I don't even consider it hours. Sometimes I forget what day of the week I'm on as long as I look at my calendar, what I actually have to do. But yeah, I'm in production for most of the day, baking and answering emails. And then at night, I I really get down to the nitty gritty and plan pitches and um, uh, work on new recipes and do a lot of research. So yeah, and of course, on the weekends. So and we do deliveries on the weekends as well. So I, I that's one thing I knew working in restaurants, I'm not afraid of hard work. So you know, with just with the recipe testing for our dual inspired sweets, that alone was months of really hard work while I was still doing the the former menu that was more simple cookies and biscotti and things like that. So yeah, it's it's great to be your own boss. I highly recommend it <laughs> for other pastry chefs or chefs out there. Right on. And let's go a little bit back into your history. You were working at Blue Hill at Stone Barns under like a pretty famous chef in, in Dan Barber and you were the pastry chef there. And uh, so tell me what that was like for you and what did you learn there that's helping you today? Sure. Yeah, it was amazing working at Blue Hill. It was such a challenge and every day was so exciting. We would go from restaurant service to I baked everything 
for the cafe. So that start in the morning to um, there's a wedding on the weekend. So and special projects or someone's coming in for a tour of the property and needs a tea service. So every day was a different schedule. And I think that it really helped me become super flexible. It's where I learned to manage a team. And um, it's actually where I found employee number two, Alex Hawkins. She was my intern at the time. So, um, and we kept in touch thereafter. And um, I knew I wanted to hire her when she was done with college. So yeah, it helped me become super flexible and just make sure that everything we do is beautiful and, you know, not sending anything out that's below standard, you know, Everything, you know, had 10 eyes on it. And it was just that kind of Michelin quality restaurant. So yeah, I think that's something you really need to be when you're in in charge of your own business, and especially your own food startup, you really need to be super flexible, be open to challenges, and um, just embrace all the difficulties and really strive every day to make your product better and, you know, value your customers. Yeah, and I thought it was really cool. I read the blog where I guess Alex wrote it, and she was talking about how you know she she went to college because sometimes for a lot of us that's just the thing you do. But she always wanted to get involved in in the culinary world in, in some sort. And how you kind of I guess there was another boss that was really hard on her, but you kind of like yeah. kept her and you said, listen, this place is hard to work at, right? This is this restaurant is no joke. So that's really cool that you guys were able to maintain that relationship. And one thing you mentioned to me before the interview started, you said Mr. Rockefeller sometimes would come in and you'd have to. To like yes. set up a play for him. So, all right. So, taking a step back, you know, I've read the original John Rockefeller biography. I guess I never didn't think about the the lineage, but I guess the family still exists. I mean, who was this Rockefeller? It sure does. Um, yeah. Today? So he is about in his late nineties, I would say, and we I would usually find out a day before that he would be coming in. His car would pull up right in the Blue Hill courtyard, and he'd have you know, a posse of like eight people and um, all different ages. And they would come in for beautiful tea. And that was like one of my favorite things. I love the challenge. And I would basically try to set up with whatever I had that day, an Alice in Wonderland kind of thing. Because when you think about John D. Rockefeller, he's, you know, been for tea at L'Arpege in Paris and all over the world. So, you know, I really wanted to make our teas stand out and, you know, usually there was nothing left and I and I heard from the wait staff that um, he enjoys his champagne. <laughs> So those are really, really fun. And yeah, getting back to Alex's blog and we're enjoying blogging and everything with our with our website. I saw a lot of myself in her and um, I had the same background growing up. I assumed, you know, I would definitely go to college and then I'd work in an office after and I did go to college and I enjoyed it, but I basically cooked my entire way through. And then once I was an office job, I was a private chef on the side. So eventually I saw the signs and went to cooking school. <laughs> wow. So, okay, this is really cool. All right. So yeah, really like uh, I, at Blue Hill, you everything's got to be 100 percent right that's um yeah and i guess so they're also they are a uh, a michelin rated uh, restaurant correct yes yes and yeah everything has to be 100 percent. but i should mention also another reason why it's such an unusual place to work because the restaurant changes much every day or it can change from hour to hour minute to minute we cater the food to the client and I think that's something I've really taken away. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's take a step back there. So you're saying that the menu could be different, completely different the next day than like tomorrow could be different than today. Yes. Basically, there would be a chef's meeting every morning and Dan would be, you know, the first one there and then the other sous chefs and chefs and, you know, the pastry team. And we would talk about what we have because this didn't come from the market that day or this did come and -and so-and-so is coming in at eight o'clock and we have to do this. So, you know, looking at reservations and looking at what we have in the walk-in and figuring out the game plan for that night. But a reason that I worked such late hours is because, you know, I might have to stick around for the bread course for someone at 10 o'clock or we have to do this something special or a special birthday cake, etc. So, I mean, it's such an exciting service and it's so, I don't know any other restaurant that is so geared towards hospitality. So wow. I've taken a lot of that with me. That's incredible. So I can see why, uh, especially Alex, like one of her, first, I guess, an internship, that's got to be a tough place to intern at if they change the menu every day. 
It really is. And, you know, a reason why and I became pastry chef because I, you know, I'm skilled in the kitchen and I'm creative, but also I think because I was a good leader and I had sympathy for the interns <laughs> because, you know, I, I was only there a few years before I got butchered at Babo by my pastry chef, who's now a close friend. And she's a James Beard award-winning pastry chef, Gina De Palma. And, you know, but I, I would come home crying every day. So, you know, it was only a few years later that I was in charge and the scars were still healing. So, yeah, I, you know, I, I was tough on the interns, but my goal was to really help them get to where they needed to be to either go back to school or stay at Blue Hill or do whatever they are that, you know, that's doing next. But, yeah, it was pretty confusing. They'd come in the kitchen and we'd I, I would print out a production sheet for that day, but at the same time go over what the menu is. So um, I highly recommend Blue Hill as an internship for any culinary students up for the task. It really helps you get that flexibility and creativity and, you know, that drive that you don't find in other restaurants where the menu hasn't changed in 15 years. Wow. And it's kind of like a, like a, for lack of a better word, like a boot camp, right? So if you can, if you can yeah. deal with like with Blue Hill, you'll be okay on your next. We have more experience and more confidence and it, it can't get any tougher. So that's cool. Well, listen, uh, Melanie, I wanted to finish up with, I guess a year from now in 2016, you know, where do you guys want to be? How many, what do you envision? Do you have uh, uh, more employees or what do you think? Yes, uh, we'd like to have a few more employees, but still keep things small because we're growing in a very positive, slow way. And um, I want to stick with that. But I would like for us to have a small storefront um, in the city. It's not necessarily a, a traditional bakery, but it's more so um, it has like a bench or a few stools and you can watch our production and we can do some client tastings there, whether it's for wedding clients or for corporate clients or do a special pop-up shop there and continue to collaborate with other brands within this space. And we're really into writing and blogging photography so a space that's well lit and where we can continue to do all of these things that make mini melanie different from other small bakery businesses we love collaborating with brands and for example dyeing our jewel truffles different colors to match your wedding color or um, what your company colors are so continuing or you know working with campari Campari Truffle Week and doing a tasting on that. So definitely looking to have our own space. I think that that will make things a lot easier right now. You know, you'll see me on the four or five train carrying bakery boxes and chocolate <laughs> and getting strange looks. So I think it'll definitely help everything run a lot smoother to have our own space. But like I said, we've come so far in one year and I want to continue our slow but very quick growth, if that makes sense, growing intelligently. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And yeah, well, I'm really happy to have you on the show. I think uh, it's going to be a treat for the listeners. And uh, you can find Melanie online at mini, M-I-N-I, Melanie, M-E-L-A-N-I-E dot com. Uh, Melanie, thank you so much. And yeah, have a uh, good rest of the day in the kitchen. Thank you so much, Matt. This is great. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for listening. And as always, if you have any questions or comments, find us online at foodstartupspodcast.com.